All right, good evening. Great to see you all tonight. Um, my name is Adam Jefford. I'm the manager of the Asia Pacific Design Library. Um, I've just got some very quick housekeeping to do tonight, but I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to their ancestors who came before them and to the elders still living today. The location of the State Library on Kurilpa Point was historically a significant meeting, gathering and sharing place for Aboriginal people. Um, and we proudly continue that tradition here today. Housekeeping toilets, if you need to use them, are on level two and level three, but could I ask that if you do need to use uh, the toilet during the lecture or if you need to leave early, that you do so via the back door on the right. In the event of an emergency, please move to the nearest exit, um, down the stairs and gather outside the Gallery of Modern Art. If your phone isn't on silent, could you please put it on silent, but remembering that we would love for you to follow along tonight using the hashtag APDL lecture. Um, we are also live streaming this event tonight um, through our Facebook page and also through the UQ Architecture Facebook page. And in about a week's time, this event will be uploaded on Vimeo for you to view as well. Um, it is my pleasure now to welcome Kelly Greenham to the stage to introduce tonight's event. Thank you, Kelly. I'll get my notes. Thanks, Adam, and welcome to the sixth lecture of the 2017 series. Firstly, I want to mention um, our final two lectures, which go on sale in terms of tickets or availability in terms of tickets uh, tomorrow. We've got Chris Major of Welsh and Major um, from Sydney, and the series concludes in week uh, for our eighth lecture with William Smart of Smart Design Studios, also from Sydney. So following this lecture, you can register for your tickets, and um, we'd love to see you again next week, of course. Tonight's uh, lecture from Turkish ar architects Alexis and Murat Sanal of Sanal Arc is generously sponsored by Think Brick, and we're really grateful to them for their sponsorship of this event. Um, and I'd like to welcome Elizabeth McIntyre from Think Brick to say a few words. Hey. Oh, thank you. Ah. I love coming to Queensland. Everyone's so friendly. Um, for those of you that aren't aware, Think Brick Australia represents um, the clay brick and paver manufacturers. And in Queensland, let's see if this works. These are Austral Bricks and PGH Bricks. And we are really excited about working and engaging with architects. If bricks aren't in contemporary design, we know that they won't remain alive. And one of the, way, one of the key ways that we engage in architecture is awards is through our Think Brick Awards. And in particular, um, just this last weekend, Alexis has great, graciously been a part of judging over nearly 300 entries to our Think Brick Awards in 2017. As an industry, another thing that we do is we take around 800 technical inquiries from architects and engineers as to how to design using brick, and we try to make this as friendly and as user um, friendly as possible. And what I would say is, for those of you that are still studying architecture, most of our calls come from graduates, and they've got their first job, and they get to their architecture firm, and they're asked to design a brick wall. And if there's nothing else that you can take away from tonight, I want you to know that we have the resources, we are here to help, and it's all actually free of charge. So um, those are just some of the resources that we have online, and as I said, we've got a team of engineers that are always welcome to take your inquiries. And in closing, I just thought you'd like to see a, s a short snippet of some, uh, a, a brief video from Kennedy Nolan Architects about just what the awards and, and the celebrating of brick in architecture has meant for them as a practice. And thank you for having us tonight. Just to be in contact with the rest of the industry, you know, it's it's not often that we get to do that. So I think that's really energetic potentially for our profession. You know, we get we get a lot out of it just by being in it, um, in understanding our own practice, and then of course, you know, we get to see what all our colleagues are doing in that in that sphere. 
when you when I look up Think Brick Awards, the, the in the wording, the push for being creative with the medium, um, being innovative with the medium, putting the challenge out there. I think I think that's getting good results. More projects coming out are giving people the confidence to know that you can use that material in different ways and be comfortable with it. Like the more you see it, the more people will be comfortable with it. But to get a reputation as being a generous award, and I know it says, you know, it's generous in terms of um, prizes or party, but for it to be generous that people kind of come in and are prepared to put their work up in terms of that kind of generosity, I think that's that's where all of that, our design community can benefit from that. You're seeing a real scope of what's happening out there across Australia. Great. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and thanks again to Think Brick for their support for this evening's lecture. Now on to Alexis and Murat Sanal. Alexis, I believe, is going to be speaking, and we'll hear from Murat during the questions. Their studio was formed in 2002, and both partners have a passion for the design of the built environment that evolves around the simple pleasures that people take in places, light, and geometry, and that celebrate people's lives. Studio activities evolve from their curiosity and innovation in building technology, employment of new technologies, commitment to nurture nature, and their passion to create more livable cities. Paramount to all of their endeavors is to contribute positive change to the genius loci of cities and the theater that everyday life creates. We'll be hearing about some of this work and their practice, so please make Alexis very welcome. Hello. Um, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, it's a gift for Murat and I to be here tonight. As um, many of you know, we were here 10 years ago when uh, Britt Anderson and UQ invited us to be lecturers at the fourth studio. Um, and, and this experience as young practitioners made a huge impact on both our imagination, what was possible, but the experience here allowed us to understand the, the, the generosity of collegialness. We were just so in love with the Queenslanders' attitude and especially Brisbane's, I don't want to say fun, but this really nice generational mentorship and, and interest in both the intellectual pursuit but then the tectonic pursuit. So I just want to say thank you very much for having us because after 10 years, it's a real gift to be here. So, um, I actually, um, Rat and I thought a lot about how we could contribute to the conversation here, and what we thought we could contribute is what it is to practice in a city like Istanbul, a developing economy. Um, many places in the world are like this, Mexico City, Sao Paulo. Um, but also talk a little bit more about practice and reflection as, um, Noted, we, we started practicing about 15 years ago, so we're at an interesting point in our career um, and pursuit. So um, tonight we'll talk about something we've really thought about for a while, which is this idea of assembled cityscapes and how you, you deal with public realm design in cities like, uh, this is um, from before. Um, one of the things we started with in thinking about this is Political boundaries are a little bit overrated, um, and the you know, and if you look at the scope of humanity, um, they're a fairly recent phenomena in their their high definition. Um, and this map I like to start with because it shows you the the movement of the land, um, but it also shows you a little bit of space and time and how cultures come together and re come together based on you know changing technologies, especially in this case. 20th century with the car and the airplane. So this diagram shows where you can get to in a two-hour flight and a five-hour flight. And I think it describes a lot about cities like Los Angeles, which is where I am born, cities like Istanbul, where Murat is born, and cities like Brisbane, where we're located now, and, and how they're kind of subtle ideas of multiculturalism and inheritance and kind of... Um, genesis of place changes by the way that people understand that space and time and how they come together and reinterpret it together. 
Um, I'm going to start with this video. Um, this is a video of a social media site called Foursquare. And what's really interesting as an introduction to a city like Istanbul is it shows you the tempo of the city over 24 hours as people check in and out with their mobile devices through GPS. And you can see, based on food and entertainment and office space and transportation, how a city lives uh, per how we wake and sleep and, and use the city. The city is a kind of resource for us to, to kind of express ourselves and understand ourselves and produce. And, and I think it really shows how these cities of 15 million people um, have this certain vitality right now, especially since places like Istanbul have a very emergent young generation. Um, most of the population, I think, um, is under 20. And so the city that they grow up in, the, the idea that they have of their environments is very, very different than even my generation. Um, and how do we design cities in preparedness for this? Um, when I moved to Istanbul in 2000 um, and settled in 2002, I found this really interesting that this was the central business district that Murat grew up in as the idea of commerce and trade. And still what you can see here is this really important thing of micro businesses and street life. Um, and this is a city that tried to take that away. And what was it? It had nothing to do with people. It all had to do with this idea of power and mobility and kind of technocratic ideas of commerce opposed to these kind of what had built the city, which is a lot on microfinance. Um, the other thing we do a lot in practice, I'm just giving a little bit background of our, our kind of excitement about Australia, is we, we try to participate. One of the things we're very interested in is in cultural policy, both in advocating for it, but also participating so we can understand it. And the city of Sydney has been actually one of the interesting pioneers on how cultural policy and art and collaborative designs can create a creative industries for it and give it a competitive edge. Um, a lot because of their extreme jealousy of Melbourne. Um, they tried to, to reinvigorate how people understood their downtown and these residual unthought about resources like the laneways. And through open calls of trying to get artists and architects and curators collaborating together, have that community rethink the, the city, but more importantly, have a whole new audience rediscover these spaces as valued spaces that can transform. And I saw Sylvia, the city architect, um, the other night, and it was so exciting to see because their struggle at that time was how do you pedestrianize the city and how do you get political change for the railway system? And this is seven years ago, and of course, everybody who've been there know that George Street is torn up right now, but I think nobody will even remember when the car consumed downtown Sydney in 10 years. Um, so as I was saying, we look a lot at cultural policy as a force of our practice and how we can work with property owners and developers and you know, uh, cultural actors to do that. And, and so this was a really important also milestone in our career to participate in this event. Um, and I also highlight this because it is through these cultural exchanges and these investments um, in human capital that, that you can actually rethink your networks and make sense of these really complex challenges that cities face. Um, so this is the city that, of 2015 of Istanbul. Um, and I, I start with this slide because I think it shows the extraordinarily beauty at one level of the city, it's extraordinarily ugliness, um, ex extraordinary amount of change in the short term and the long term, but also it's interesting idea of rebuilding itself. We've recently been looking a lot at this area right here on top of this hill. And one of the things that, why I start here is that what we learned is this part of the community, which is kind of four major neighborhoods, was actually established in the 16th century with a, the, what is called the Barbaros city, which was one of the major generals of the Ottoman Empire. And this is where they, they did, the, the, the residents of the Roman community lived because below here is all the shipbuilding district. And this for 500 years has been a multicultural neighborhood of Northern Africans and Greek, Turkish called Rum, but also different people who are part of this 
huge commerce of shipbuilding and, and movements of people, and this is where their families lived. Um, and they, through this, have, you know, there's this impression that the, the African community that lives there now is a recent thing, but this is actually, we learned, um, actually not the case. And I think one of the things that's often mistaken in the rebuilding of cities that have a very historic perspective is that each time they're rebuilt in a certain type of cruelty, which in Istanbul is certainly a case in a lot of places, but also there's this really rich cumulative um, importance in why certain, especially residential neighbors, have this resilience through this change. So the, this community still remains to be um, very much of the same mix for the four or 500 years. Um, but you also see these high-rise districts coming in. I will talk about a neighborhood over here in a little bit. Um, and then, of course, how the technology of roads and introduction of manufacturing changes the city. Um, in this picture alone, we see about two million people living, and this is a very small part of the city. Um, and one of the things that's really interesting for us as we talk about the kind of rewilding of Istanbul or reintroducing of the watersheds, um, in 1946, this is an image from the city photography. This is the exact same peninsula, ooh, sorry. Exact same peninsula that I just showed you. That, that area is right here, up here. And that's the one watershed coming down and the other watershed coming down. And these are the four neighborhoods. And there's the Greek church and another Greek church in that neighborhood. Um, one of the things we're really interested in how food production was still only, you know, 70 years ago, very important to the shaping of the city. Um, and how this food production and pathways um, across uh, the city are still seen in the, the daily life of people's patterns, but also um, in how we could really think of a post-industrial Istanbul. And I, I'll come back to this a little bit, but I think you can see how rapidly the city has transformed in the last 70 years, and at the same time, knowing that this neighborhood has been established for 500 years ago, you know, is a very interesting idea of renewing the city um, and history. So, a little bit of the background um, of us and where we work. One of the big questions we ask of ourselves is what draws us into life? And, and here we think a lot about, because as architects, how can we contribute to the city? So how can place nurture social, so social society? In what ways does spatial and material design foster creativity and knowledge exchange? Does formal expressions and narratives offer meaning, emotional, and shared experiences? And I'll come back to this in the end, but I think architects have played a very big role in how we define narratives for the future and a shared future, and, um, and how we create these emotional relationships to place um, can be a very powerful um, cultural, opportunity for both living culture, but also the cumulative culture, the cultures we inherit and respect. Um, we also see our design practice as a very iterative process, and you know, that every time you get someplace, you learn something so much more, and how you can kind of reframe that and draw it back in and reconnect to the community, or how when you get to kind of building the place, how that becomes a new idea of expression and experience for that community. And then how this is a very cyclical process. And we're, we, we drew this when we started um, 12 years ago, and we always present it as one of the first pieces to our clients. And, and we're always amazed how much they actually get it because the city, the private sector, the residents have a really deep understanding of this um, continual transformation that the built environment goes through. Um, one of our big focuses is on uh, not just research, but what our role can be for sharing intelligences that we think are really interesting that haven't been tapped into. And this is two pieces of work that I will share today of our research, one of which is the bizarre making, this is a practice from, you know, we are, we're not really rigorous academics, but from all of our observation and uh, talking with historians has been happening for well over a thousand years with very little change, as well as a new project that we're just about to publish 
which is uh, what we call the Imaginable Guidelines, which is the first crowdsourced design guidelines for a city using the, the kind of emotional intelligence and the expert intelligence of the city to create a type of nonlinear guideline. So I'm going to start here with Pizarre making. Um, when we first moved to Istanbul, I was totally fascinated by these structures. They were just incredible. They would set up markets in two hours in any land. I mean, that was the thing that I think first struck me. They could set up in a watershed, like a steep watershed. They could set up in streets, high-density streets in a historic neighborhood. And they could set these things up to be 40,000 square meters or 400 square meters. Um, this one, 40,000. This one, 4,000. This is um, 400 square meters. And they could respond to any terrain, any weather. Um, but more importantly, what I came to understand is that the people that make these structures, which are called Pizarre Jilar, which is the Pizarre maker or the market maker, they're actually a protected craft. And they have a very formal relationship with the communities they go into and with the municipality to permit them. Has a protected craft that's passed down for, as I mentioned, a thousand years, but that this craft has not fundamentally changed over this time. They use three simple elements, ropes, tarps, and poles, and you'll see it in a minute, and connect to buildings. And from my understanding, it is actually, so here are the rope knots and the, the tarps and how they kind of connect around, that this technology, despite access to, um, economic opportunities, meaning uh, ready-made structures, um, has not changed. And why it hasn't changed, um, sorry, is that they have perfected this generative structure's ability to expand and contract, to add new participants in the market, to take out participants in the market, to respond to any terrain with the same equipment, and instead of investing in new technologies or new things, they actually have invested in the different ways that the fibers or the tarps respond to the system and seasons. Um, and despite a popular impression that they're informal or that um, they're dangerous, we spend a lot of time talking to the local uh, police, the Zabata, and there is actually no reports of crime and no reports of injury in these structures. And this is really important because it actually creates one day of week in each neighborhood, accessible fresh food in walking distance, but it creates a social place where everybody in the neighborhood comes together and, and experiences each other. And, and because of this, everybody looks after each other. And these, these gentlemen that run the market are not about to let anybody come in and interfere in this very, um, important social structure. Um, to, to make the point even further, despite efforts and policy to remove them, to modernize, there's over 450 markets a week in Istanbul, and one of the things you see is how evenly they're placed, even through the new parts of the city, and how evenly they're placed throughout the day. Um, this is one of the markets that's in a parking area, and this is, again, one of the ones that is about 4,000 square meters, and I'm going to just play a short film for you. In 2015, our studio received a research grant from the Graham Foundation to um, document the research that we had collected, and one of the gifts of this grant was to be able to commission Superpool to do a current map of the area, to work with a videographer to document the craft of making these things, um, and to work with an illustrator to carefully, carefully document the whole portfolio of knots that they use, as well as, ooh, sorry, interview um, the different people that go into making it. And what we learned through this is not only that these gentlemen cooperate every morning to make these structures, um, but more importantly to our surprise, they actually make them exactly the same way every week. They put the same rope, the same pole, the same working with their colleagues. Every single week, they recreate these structures, as well as that they have whole systems sorted out for uh, fire, so that they can take down the entire structure in 15 minutes to avoid spread. Um, 
And of course, anybody who is involved with um, sailing can appreciate the, the kind of complexity of um, knots and, and pulley systems um, that they use in this redundant structure. Um, so you can see the size and expanse of these structures, their ability to move from large spaces to small spaces, expand and contract um, based on the weather. This is a snowy day. Um, they are not discouraged by snow, sun, rain. Um, this is another, uh, the second important work I want to share because this is also about co-creating a project and a resource. This is a project that we, we started about four years ago in response to this idea that the knowledge capital to design the city isn't available in Istanbul, that we would always have to import these models from Europe or, or from East Asia, that we, we somehow could not, um, from our own um, community, aggregate the, the knowledge and actors to create a design guideline for the city. And this was really disappointing for Murat and I because we work with a lot of engineers and we work with a lot of uh, landscape designers and we work with a lot of sociologists. And this we know is just not true. It's just that they're all highly fragmented. And, and how do you bring all of this knowledge together so that you can come up with this kind of shared document that can um, both empower uh, those actors' aims but also empower local people to, to be part of the vocabulary that experts use in designing cities. Um, and one of the things that we try to do is also add to the role of design guidelines in cities and ask ourselves, what is the, the, the new imagination construct that needs to come together to, to help us rethink our cities in this kind of post-industrial, post-modernized way? And we came to understand that one of the things you need is the emotional intelligence of artists and designers, and then the expert intelligence of engineers and policymakers and also designers. Um, but you need to make it really measurable. Like you need to help people understand how this, is this a technical problem? It is a, it is a behavioral policy problem, a policy problem. And what does it impact? Does it impact the sustainability of the city, the wellness of the city? Um, and we also worked for, a while, for quite a while to um, find also all the NGOs and, and social civil organizations that were working to enable people to uh, have access to resources and communities uh, for city change. Um, whoops. And three or four years on, we have we were very, very excited to finally achieve this. We have over 164 contributors. Um, all of this has been crowdsourced, and what we found through this project is this one simple fact. People are incredibly generous with what they have if they feel it will be valuable and the people that use it value it. Um, we would have writers meetups to rewrite the cards as we know that you know designers and um, are not great writers, um, so that it, everything is also written in a very accessible language, so the most, you know, uh, everyday person to as somebody who is an expert in another field can create a dialogue um, and have a common language and go beyond the jargon. Um, and we've started using this to rethink streets in Istanbul, how you can get property owners um, larger campus projects, the municipality, to actually get on the table and say, what do you wish happens? What do you want to happen? What, do you, you know, what are your priorities as a resident? And trying to find new ways to think of streets and public spaces. I think also really important to this is this idea of time management, that cities, roads, which rake up about 30, for, 30 to 40% of our cities, um, public space, are actually underutilized on the weekends. And, and they're, they're really exciting platforms for us to reinvent public life in highly dense cities. Um, so how can we start new discussions? We don't have the answers, um, but we hope this contributes to, to that possibility of just provoking discussion and shared languages. Um, the other thing we focus a lot on um, 
which I talked about in the beginning with the, the work we did with the laneways, is, is the role of policy in participating in how we can work with both our client groups and city groups and also peers in sharing resources and those resources really enabling living culture. And these are two projects that we did, which is um, Bomanti, which is a public realm design for a, a historic beer factory that has a lot of um, entertainment and creative office, and then a research library for a cultural center, um, its expansion. But one of the things that's been really exciting in both of these projects that I want to bring to the attention tonight is not just the design work, but working with these institutions and organizations, not to see this as physical space, but as enablers of culture, a and how can you use these spaces as a resource for different actors to, to, to advance their interest and practices in coming together. And we're very fortunate to, to we consider you to work on the creative board of this one, um, and this one we continue to, to work on how to fine tune that collection. Um, I showed you, again, a picture of this before, so that's that same peninsula, and you can see those watersheds. And that historic beer factory campus is situated in here. Um, and what's interesting about this, if you can see the land coming down, um, this part of the city, you can see the informal sediment, the cemetery, the high-rise district. Up until the 1950s, um, this land was not buildable and hence why you get the informal housing and the cemetery. But it wasn't until the 2000s that the technology to build high-rises was available. And of course, all of these sites amongst the city that were not buildable uh, without this advanced engineering and very, very um, fast capital that could finance structures this big, these lands remain kind of untouched. And now they're just, um, unfortunately, uh, you know, coming out of the ground like mad in this kind of haphazard way. And yet, what was around them before, between the, the buildable land for the residential and this, were a lot of these industrial um, manufacturing from the turn of the century to the 1960s. So throughout the city, you see the informal settlements that supported the kind of big industrial sites along here. And you see these kind of micro-industrial heritage sites that need to be redefined now that industry doesn't happen in the city. And yet, around those sites is this new residential fabric and business fabric that also doesn't have a clear place in the city. So the beer factory is located right there in the middle of that. And one of the things that we, we do see the role of this factory to do is to be a laboratory how we can kind of manage or not manage, but rethink this conundrum of, of city growth and, and what the role can be. This is, again, you see the gardens that I showed you in the beginning. So this is a postcard of that beer factory from the turn of the century with the, the, the agricultural around it. Um, and you can see how these industrial sites became abandoned as industry left the city, um, but nobody know how to repurpose them. So again, the ecology just came in and took over. All these indigenous species just came back and re-inhabited these spaces. Um, and today, after a restoration, it looks like this. And, and the idea of the place is to create this kind of curious core of creative campuses that includes entertainment, but also um, non-commercial office space for um, design industry, for fashion industry, for gastronomy, to actually experiment and understand these things and, and how that can spill out and become a business model for other sites around the area. The other thing, um, we came in after the renovation was done by Hans Mertiken, and our role in this project was to do the public realm design. Um, and our first response to that was to reintroduce those indigenous species that had been there before, not the edible species from the farms, but the, the species that keep coming back and back into the city and, and not, um, and just be, make people conscious again that as we, um, we live with all these different creatures and, and these creatures are, are fragile 
and they're important to our happiness, but they're also important to our city's longevity in terms of their ability to um, foster seasons and smells and consciousness, but also the greening that we need to, to deal with storm water, to deal with energy production. Um, and we spent a lot of time working with this developer in the city to have a consciousness before history, there was a land here. And that if we can think about, this is our site, if we can think about what we do here in a bigger sense, can we rethink about the geography and the, the entire habitat of this area and then reintroduce these things beyond our small site? And how do we create a haptic experience beyond just the kind of species to, to bring that consciousness of interconnectedness that we, we need to start thinking beyond our property lines? And also how we think about that from the streetscape all the way down to the entertainment uh, spaces and the cultural spaces. So how do we deal with bioswells and these more botanical gardens and then more familiar ideas of the courtyard um, that gives us shade and light, but then using natural materials throughout the project to remind ourselves that these trees not only are, are important species, but they actually provide the building materials that enable us to do our cultural production and inhabitants. Um, the other thing we spend a lot of time thinking about is sustainable design in the sense the one thing that architects can really contribute to, to where we go in the future in the 21st century is to not pollute. And to, so one of the things that this project we're really proud of is it's actually uh, a net zero project, we, we do all of the energy from solar panels, but anybody who's done uh, art space recently may appreciate that you actually see no mechanical here. Um, we were able to use these spaces as plinths, and we use actually air moving through the whole space as though it was built 120 years ago before mechanical systems to allow fresh air to move through here, um, and then also reintroduce all natural materials um, as part of that. And although we don't, um, try to make it overt in the experience, we feel like this is the one thing that we can do as architects to, again, make our cities more livable and, and, and reduce the exhaust and pollution and add new experiences into these spaces that were formerly, these were cellars. And I think the last thing that we spend a lot of time on is working with the, the traditional crafts and how we can reinvent those crafts as we move into this this new phase. So we spent a lot of time here. I know it's the bathroom, but um, it is the place that we spent, we brought in this continual gradient from outside with the paving in and worked with all the craftsmen that do the traditional mirroring. I don't know if anybody's been to Istanbul, but there's this craft of mirroring the signs um, in all the neighborhoods, and it's a handcraft, um, as well as worked very closely with uh, the tile makers uh, to, to, you know, rather than using reindustrialized uh, white porcelain in here, to really think of how these handmade tiles can come back into these spaces. Um, and again, just this very subtle haptic experience that sometimes the handmade is just a little bit kinder. We also spend a lot of time here working with public programs and design activists um, and commissioning through our resources, um, possibilities for them to express themselves. So this is a platform called Shihirna Sesver, which means give your city a voice. And this design organization um, works with students and neighborhood residents to tell the stories of past together and then turns them into infographics that can be distributed um, publicly. And because we're able to do this um, through our resources, all this stuff is available for free back to the residents. You can download it, you can share it. And this particular one I show because it's a very obvious history of that uh, industrial heritage I just talked about from uh, the 1880s uh, setting up to, to today. We also think we talk a lot about what the role of drawing is um, in contemporary practice. And one of the things that we think is really important about drawing is, again, is to allow different people to explore their imaginations in a place they're familiar with. So how can uh, these different property owners, including a university, um, 
the, the, the central treasury, um, a hotel operator, a private developer, actually start seeing their environment as a holistic ecology and a holistic experience for their different uh, communities, for the student, uh, for the, the, the gentleman that would come work in these offices, for the hotel residents, for somebody that would enjoy our campus, so that we can break these understandings of kind of political, very synthetic boundaries. And how, you know, maybe if we draw it just a little bit bigger, um, you know, the city and other people would be excited about that. And we think there's a lot of truth in this because, as you can see, everybody can enjoy the simple pleasures of sun and touching something natural and, and being together. And, um, and I think one of the things that makes that possible is allowing for people to define the places themselves. So one of the things I wanted to share in this project with you tonight because I hear it a lot in Australia, and again, it was the thing that we found so interesting with the city of Sydney, using small projects and micro projects to allow for people to explore and rethink it before rolling out big solutions. And then those solutions respond actually to the behaviors that come about. So one of the things we did when we opened this project is come up with this program we called Making Place. And it was a program to, to constantly change and respond to how people use the space. And at first, people were unfamiliar with this site. It had just been open. You can see the construction continuing. And how they would use this big open room. Um, and, and so we reduced the scale of that room so that they could feel a little bit more intimate in that space um, and have a theater in that space. And then a few months later, that whole space, everybody knew what to do and how to use it, and, and they found their own way in it. And then we moved it over here to see if people would really come to, to bigger events um, and, and, and really see this as a shared possibility. And I think anybody that's worked kind of in the, you know, any place in Europe east of the Rhine, we were really excited because what you can see starting to happen is people are sitting on these informal environments and they're sitting on grass. Um, and, and they're, you know, finding their own little micro spaces throughout. Um, and, and this was one of these things that people tell you, oh, it's never going to be done, we need to privatize everything, um, people will never use common seatings, we need to make everything a kind of food court and tell them how to use it, and it's just not the case. Uh, the same videographer that we work with for the, the bizarre video, we started working with on these time last videos, and okay, they, they have an entertainment quality, but we watch a lot in these videos how people find themselves in the microspaces, how they use the gateway to come in and stop and pause, and then how the spaces change from day to night. Um, and, and so it's been a really interesting experience for us. Um, so. Back to the shared resources, I'm going to actually go through this one quite quickly. This is a library that we did for a cultural center. Um, and this was done actually just after we left here in 2011. Um, and we spent a lot of time here really looking and sampling the neighborhood around and trying to think how people would reoccupy this building. It was located in a place at the time, um, was not really understood as a cultural center since this institution came. Uh, the area around has significantly transformed as the kind of so cultural hub of Istanbul. Um, we looked a lot at the building and how we can reinterpret that geometry and craft to make new objects for people to discover. Um, we created new seatings for people to engage in their collection, um, which was a lot of multimedia as well as a normal collection. But what I wanted to get to is this. In last year, the same institution approached us for an expansion, and this was a big shock to us because um, when we started this project, we always giggled, like, how, you know, we put in 120 seats, nobody's going to come sit here, you know, you're never going to fill this up. And within two years, you couldn't find a seat in this place. Um, and one of the things that was so unexpected is that the user that came the most was people from the ages of 16 to 22. And I want to, to bring attention that nobody lives around here. There is no residential fabric around here. So all of these people are coming um, quite a distance to use this library and this collection. And this is at 9.50 a.m. on a Sunday. 
these people are waiting in line to use this resource. Um, and I think what I want to highlight is when we think of the public realm, we also have to think of all the macro institutional environments that go into helping young people, uh, you know, people in late in their career, aspire and, and become productive platforms for where they want to go. Um, and this is a really interesting phenomenon that we see and what I'm getting at with that young generation. Um, and this is the original library that was very kind of respectful of the building, just creating these little micro settings. But in the second one, we tried to be much bolder in the sense that this was now in the utilitarian basement, and we knew that we had um, an audience that was very now engaged in the collection, but also had a behavior of using the library. So for example, we worked also with the, the city library, IBB, and they have no understanding actually how to engage this new audience because this new audience has a whole different understanding about how they can occupy space or socialize in space or concentrate in space. And, and so we created a space that was very playful, more like a, a kind of a terrain moving through, uh, a place that you could kind of each time come and find a different perspective, and then a very conventional space that, that we understand for, um, you know, uh, research and, and carols and concentrated area. Um, and one of the things we tried to do here is back to this natural material, is just by using the natural light of the street, which is not much, um, and, and changing the perspective of the user to borrow that light coming in, um, to create this very comfortable experience with paper and wood and light. Um, and the end result is um, this environment where you, kind of, you have the carols behind and the very simple tables moving you around and, and the lighting elements. And again, these lights are all created by um, the lighting district just adjacent there. Um, and we worked with these kind of local lighting guys. It was very fun. I'll, I can talk about it more later. Um, the first day it opened, we, we had a few of their, their kind of um, conventional research crowd. And this space was actually designed because this research crowd got so frustrated with these young users um, that they needed their own dedicated space. So you actually had to sign up to use this space and dedicate that you would um, actually research there. But what was amazing is we insisted throughout this project that just outside of this room, we create this little cram corner. And this photo is two hours after this space opened. Like, this is, again, on a Tuesday at 11 o'clock, is how all of these people just knew how to occupy this space. Um, and they just came in and filled it. And, you know, it was really quite beautiful to see how you know, what is called the digital nomad or what else, they're just having a whole new understanding of what resources and dedicated resources they need. And um, I think this is something that we really need to prepare for. So the last thing I want to talk about is this idea of sharing place. Um, one of the things that modernity taught us is this kind of segregation of program and place. And I think one of the roles that architects and practice can, can do is really liberate this idea that even if it's designed as a car park or it's designed as a library or it's designed as a this, it's actually only by us describing this use that we inhibit other uses. But the human being has an extraordinary imagination on how to readapt these resources and these spaces and these narratives for their own purpose, especially when we liberate ourselves from these kind of very, very distinct programs. Um, this is a car park that we, we did. Um, it's a thousand car car park with a park on top. Um, again, reorienting you in the city. This image is taken straight down from the first image I showed you. So if you were in the same drone camera looking straight down, you're looking back to the historic peninsula and the Genovese city. And this is the original uh, Genovese wall of the city and the tower. And you can also see how this has been rebuilt over and over, or maybe not very gracefully. Um, and, and as a young practice 
who has an incredible amount of love and excitement about the past and our story and the preciousness of um, preserving this, it's also equally interesting to work in a place that is constantly reconstructing this as it's relevant to their time. And where that time begins and ends, is it 2,000 years ago, is it 200 years ago? Um, and how we make sense of it. And one of the things that we're really excited about is that idea that there's things that transcend all of that, which is, you know, the geography, but also the more kind of celestial things like the sun movement, the wind movements, the species we live with, the stones that we extract from the earth, this tree species that we reuse to kind of construct our environments. And in this project, even though it introduces a very new geometry to the city, moving your body around to view the city and back up, it actually borrows from a lot of historic elements. For example, this room, we call it a room, you enter from here, you can enter from here, you can enter from under from the metro, is the exact same size here as the new mosque courtyard that has also entered the same way. It's all made from bergamot granite, which is a, a quarry that's been used for Istanbul's city building for centuries. And we try to create a palette of species that is part of this geography of the Halic, the Golden Horn. Um, and one of the things we tried to do with these materials is reflect these experiences so that you could really see the horizon and the sun moves from here all the way over here throughout the summer to the winter. Um, you can see the reflection of the clouds in the, the, the paving. And you can just see people, again, if you understand how people are assumed to sit in public space, we find that people do enjoy and sit in these spaces in different ways. Um, and this is a short film of this. And one of the things that we find very interesting is watching how people rediscover their city um, in this space. Again, it's, it's in a commercial district. It's on the edge. It's a multinodal transit hut. It connects to the metro. Um, there's no residential fabric around here. Um, but we find people do come out at sunset and they bring their, you know, dinner and, and drinks and they sit and watch the sun. We find business people come out at lunchtime and spend time on the phone. Uh, we find tourists come out and kind of play in fun ways or sit on the desks, decks here. Um, and we find people really spending a lot of time you know, filming themselves. And I think you notice this is a, a really horrible six lane road here, and yet they're finding a new relationship to go b beyond that road and look back out to this big ecology down there. Um, and so this was really exciting to see that if, you know, you, you re-change the city, people reinterpret it for you. You, you know, they, they, they come to you and say, oh, can I use it this way, can I use it that way? And, and one of the big accomplishments for us in that was that we, um, twofold, one is that we had the Moving Museum, which is a large biannual that travels to different cities in the world, take over the first two floors um, and turn it into a, a sort of museum for two months. And an amazing amount of social media photos of people having, not of the work, but people having fun in this space of different ages and generations. Um, but also, what we found is that I would get phone calls for the first two years after it opens of women that would come to this neighborhood for events or dinners or other things, and they would call me and say, thank you, I finally feel safe to go home. Like, we, we built another type of trust capital by reintroducing the fresh air, reintroducing the light, allowing for visual access, for people to not see this type of infrastructure work as frightening and dirty and filthy. Um, and that was a really powerful moment for us to see how it really affected people's lives emotionally enough to contact us. Um, and one of the things, and again, I'm just kind of zooming further and further out for you, so you can see that's the peninsula I originally showed you, and that's the area with the, pen the, the historic peninsula I showed you, and, and now we're just one step further out, and in the last district I'll share a little bit about. Um, 
it's actually become, an, you know, the, the parking has become beloved of enough of a site that Murat was approached two years ago um, from the mayor to turn it into a wedding salon for the area. Um, so I think it's really interesting. I, I, you know, the, you, you kind of find the ex unexpected coming to you when you're open to it. Um, some of you may know the very political project to re redo this waterfront into a very large um, kind of commercial entertainment hotel investment. Um, and this is the, the original cannon factory for the Ottoman Empire, this incredibly beautiful mosque that was actually um, a miniature of um, Hagia Sophia to understand the structural qualities of that, but a working coulier with the, the baths, the cemetery, the, the sacred spaces of the mosque, and then the public fountain. And recently we've been asked, not recently, actually for the last six years, we've been working in this little tiny neighborhood here with six different property owners to, to rethink how you can get a residential neighborhood back in there and a residential neighborhood of people that want to live there. Um, and that's been a really interesting challenge because, again, one of the things is rewriting that story that is not just a place of kind of consuming the historic center, but a place that you could actually raise your family or, or have different generations live there or different economic groups live there and how that they would make their own meaning from that. Um, and it's been a really interesting challenge. Um, one of the things that is available is old maps of these areas. And I just, sorry, go back one step. One of the things you see here is the historic port. So this is where all the trade happened from those shipbuilders. This is actually where that trade was kind of in a value added or a depot proposition. So this whole fabric in here has never really been residential and it's never been high value uh, commercial. But up here, this is, this is where all the ambassadors and all of the, the residents of different countries and merchants live to actually oversee this global capital trade for, you know, from 200, 500 years ago. So this is this kind of really interesting residual space that constantly changes in this, this shift of economic production. Um, and what we learned by looking at, so that's that shore and the old ports, and this is the neighborhood I'm referring to, is this used to be where they built the boats. And this used to be over here, uh, no, over here, the place that they stored all the tobacco. And as you can see, these were the shops and traders, but here you had a much more kind of informal area for, for these things, and also the gardens again. These are all identified for those, those kind of productive lands for gardens. And in thinking of that, one of the things we again did is show that this place actually works. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, to redraw this as, as very fragmented places. But th these places are very rich and dense and people are using them. And if they were just reconnected, which would be so easy to do, you would have an entire neighborhood reworking together. So you have the pieces there, but we just need to reconnect it. And you have amazing species living through there. You have these very funky little narratives that are very beloved elements, despite their kind of bizarrety. You have new creative businesses coming in, also redefining the neighborhood. His name is Haja Mimi, so they, they called it Saint Mimi. And we, we've been working a lot with a graphic designer to think about how we can re, rename these neighborhoods and come up with a kind of graphical quality and draw them to allow for these micro projects and species to come in. Again, kind of how do you introduce these habitats and the backdrop, and, and see them as porous spaces, that if the private developers allowed people again to walk through their passages, you would end up with this cross-fertilization and these deep soil plantings. And if we redraw it not as a real estate development, but as different ways to live and think about the city, can we get different residents coming to live in this neighborhood? And, and can we create a much more natural relationship back through there and, and communal spaces that are also accessible to the public? 
So I will just end here um, in kind of where we've come to really think about practice and, and how we can use drawing and elements of the city um, to define where we're going. And I think this really captures it, um, which is this, this kind of notion of the superfiction, that the imagination loses vitality as it ceases to adhere to what is real, when it adheres to the unreal and intensifies what is unreal. Well, the first effect may be extraordinary. That effect is the maximum effect that it'll ever have. And this gets us a lot of thought as we look at our colleagues that go after these very kind of um, iconic projects that, that really add very little to anything but this kind of fast capital power structures. Um, and they do, they, they're gone, they, they're not meaningful after five years despite their enormous investment and their nor enormous kind of um, intention to, to provoke change. So, um, thank you. Very much. Hi. Thank you. rich and dense lecture so thank you so much Alexis and I'd like to invite Murat and Britt Anderson to join us on stage. Britt is um, an emeritus professor at UQ School of Architecture and has taught many of us um, who are here tonight and of course she's also the recipient um, in the past of an AIA gold medal so we always like to acknowledge that so welcome Murat and Britt to the stage. We've only got about 10 minutes for discussion I'm afraid but um, I'm sure we'll get to some great Great point, so thanks very much. Yeah. Can you hear? Yeah, you can. I'm switched on. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much. That was really brilliant. Thank you. But I have a few questions. I'll actually start with a statement because with all your research and your practice, you also publish, mm. you have um, uh, friendships with uh, developers who think like you. Um, you know people in the press. Uh, you engage in exhibitions. So it is, but it spreads from the um, seriousness of the work mm. that you do at heart. And I've just received a copy of your book on the making of the um, bazaar and the bazaar makers. So it's so encouraging to see that out of the work of two people who come from Los Angeles and, and set themselves up, uh, that they can build not only their practice, but also the networks that will spread the work that you do and, in, and change it as well. So I wanted to know if you were now come thinking back to Los Angeles, what would be the main um, reason, well, how would you go about making it work there for you? How would you build a practice in Los, An Los Angeles now that you see what you can do in Istanbul? That's a question we have tried to avoid asking ourselves <laughs> given the current context. <laughs> um, but you showed yeah. those photographs at yeah. the beginning, didn't yeah. you? So yeah. I did wonder about that because is it, is it that Istanbul has all that culture um, beyond the two, three hundred years of the United States or two hundred years of Australia? Is it, is it the depth of the culture and that map that you showed of where you can fly within two and five hours? Is that part of it or...? Well, I'm going to say something a little bit different. I'm just going to start the tone because I think I've been going back and forth to LA more recently. And one of the things that struck me very much of flying over it is that it's a city of shacks mm. on very large land. And since we've been in Australia, the one question that keeps coming up is how do we deal with these growing populations? And I, I just feel like this experience in Istanbul and our understanding of Los Angeles, how do you rethink this land resource and amplify it? Because they have to go through a new rethink of property and residential life and mobility. And I just feel like those cities, I think that's also part of the imaginable guidelines, has to tap into what developing cities have figured, are, are figuring out, like Sao Paulo or she, mm. South Korea um, with Seoul or Istanbul, that they now need to demodernize these regulatory structures that have 
Um, so that's the one thing I'm just really struck when I go, um, is, is that these cities surprisingly have more to teach some of these places now about density and rethinking and mm. agility. Mm. Um, and I think that that conversation, um, that asymmetry that has so come from those kind of regulations telling these cities that are informal how to operate and improve are going to find that inverted mm. world. And I, I mean... What about you, Laura? Because you know the culture from inside, so to speak. How, how do you find the practice there contrasts with elsewhere? I think it's uh, every place and every culture has uh, their um, qualities differently, obviously. Um, and I think it's, even though I'm born and raised in Turkey, practiced abroad, uh, um, I learned a lot about, uh, after I returned and uh, uh, even during the period of the practice, even this uh, bazaar uh, research, for example, had taught our practice a lot how uh, when people start to know and you share that knowledge, they, uh, they can organize themselves. And I think, uh, I think this growth of the cities is a, uh, seems to be a very simple thing that nobody can uh, manage. But actually, mm -hmm. if you just bring out your uh, you know, treasury box and let everybody know, I think everybody will focus on the keeping the treasure box safe. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I feel like we, when we came, we just sat down for four or five years by trying to observe our culture of making, uh, um, producing and consuming, and uh, try to evaluate uh, their strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And after that, we start to feel a little bit more comf uh, comfortable how to uh, do, to be uh, more instrumental or to use those instruments. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we know from good mentors, I, I think work is not important, the practice is mm -hmm. uh, everything. And mm -hmm. uh, if you just focus on one icon here, something there, it's mm -hmm. not enough. Uh, it's the conglomeration of everything. Mm -hmm. And things uh, come back. I can't say uh, what this would ref the reflection of this in Los Angeles, but I certainly uh, would be very excited again like, to look with this, all this in the background, because it won't be the same as I saw 15 years ago mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but there's so many um, things to in inspire from, and the, the core is the knowledge and the people and the network, really. And there's uh, only very few good people in the world, I think, and it's not very hard to tap to that network. And you just, uh, I think, and once you learn, and if you share that with your uh, surrounding, it's, it would be that easy as the setting up a bazaar, I think, mm. and uh, sharing, uh, uh, you know, that 400, 4,000 square meter that normally normal real estate people or normal greedy people would kill each other. Yes, that's true. One of the things that you, you probably, I don't know if, you, if the audience could imagine it, but the big car park at Hussein um, mm. Park, uh, you do go down many, many levels yes. into the ground. And it is extraordinary to come up because I don't know if you could see that it's a it's sort of a viewing platform yes. for the city. And so uh, just that it's not just feeling safe, it's just that drama of moving up and then once you're there, you're kind of lifted up and surrounded by those houses and you look straight out mm -hmm. to, the, to the view. It's pretty special. And uh, so you could imagine a wedding or three up there. <laughs> That's why the mayor said, because everybody's taking pictures there. So yeah. <laughs> we can a yeah. wedding. No, it's quite, so, it's quite something. But I think it's, again, sharing what you have. Again, we have, we have a... Um, very authentic city, and very, uh, if you make it part of the everyday experience, I think people start to appreciate it. Mm. And that's how the, um, the integration of the viewing, uh, uh, viewing uh, decks, viewing terraces, uh, and the Soleil walks mm. uh, came about. And, and I, I think a part of our task is always like letting the users know of their 
uh, of the places that they're in, the qualities, and to learn. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate that p people politicize uh, a lot of things. I mean, uh, it's unfortunate that if I have to defend that, you see the, uh, you know, uh, three out of the uh, seven uh, hills of Istanbul from our uh, to a mayor. It's unfortunate because he should have known that. <laughs> <laughs> but, mm, yeah. but I think when people come and discover that, it's very nice, mm. and uh, and pe people do. I think people appreciate. Uh, and we had amazing set of engineers, like to have that uh, visual access uh, uh, in three halls that are uh, 60 meter by 80 meters. Uh, and I remember. And uh, having a cross ventilation um, uh, 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 from the, uh, using the prevailing wind, uh, cross ventilate the whole thing, um, uh, and we uh, and uh, transferring the whole uh, car parks mm. uh, structure and the park structure mm. uh, is uh, structurally was very dif uh, of course difficult uh, from the structural design point of view, but and for uh, extra cost for the investors, uh, but they have done it. I mean, they when again like this sharing helped us helped us I think uh, to, to achieve that. Yeah. One of the things also that you didn't talk about much was those beautiful small infill houses mm. and the detailing that's gone into them because that's another quality in the city. Mm that when you do come across something beautiful like that at a very, very small scale, that it actually s might seem incidental, but it's mm. very deeply memorable. Mm. So it, there's these big gestures that you've shown, but the, you didn't show very much of these, especially the use of the marble. Marble mm. there is an everyday material in a in yeah. very beautiful material to work with, and I, I saw that in some of the work that you and Alexis had done. Yes, uh, this is again like uh, the the studying of the uh, 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 people who actually work in built environment. They produce uh, marble in very very uh, good uh, quality, and uh, if you work with them uh, for uh, and if you care and, and talk to them, what they would like to achieve, and that's and how they uh, would like to achieve. Uh, we under, we under, uh, came to understand their capabilities, and they're beyond what they were beyond what they were thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, um, there had been cases that they thought this wouldn't be building materials, but actually, um, that housing, uh, that uh, the, those small infill projects, actually presented in small scale, uh, that even in a small um, building scale, that you can achieve a lot of things from the building facade into uh, like bathroom detailing. Mm. Yes, I think it's, um, it's a wonderful achievement to be able to work both at the, the scale of very small things in architecture mm. to cityscape making. And that's my cue from Kelly. I think she's going to wave. Okay, so did you have anything that you wanted to end on? It's, been a one, it's just been such a nice thing to see your work here. And I do hope that those of you who get to travel to uh, Istanbul get a chance to see it in the experience of the city because it's an extraordinary city. Totally unprepared for the geography when I arrived. But it's, um, it's very much a, a city that you can sense it's changing all the time. I mean, the, what is the population growth each year? It seems just remarkable that it can run so smoothly. We just hope that the politics improve. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> this is in on air, sorry. <laughs> Global politics at that. <laughs> that. That's probably a great moment to finish and thank you, say thank you so much to Alexis and Murat and to Britt for yeah, yeah, yeah. participating tonight. Thank you, thank thank you very you. much. That's really nice. Before we finish tonight, I've got a couple of final things that I have to do. One is to announce the game of Archive Spy winner, and tonight it is Paul of Six with a gorgeous um, photo there. So if you haven't been playing Archive Spy, please do um, join in on Instagram, tagging us with the Archive Spy hashtag, and Paul of Six, you will be um, communicated with from SLQ. Finally tonight is just a reminder that we have tickets available, as I mentioned earlier, so jump online and get your tickets for the final two lectures that go on sale as of tomorrow. Thank you very much and have a good evening. <laughs>